Welcome to the first video in our series on absorption and variable costing. This will be a three-part series, with this first video providing an introduction to absorption costing. Part two of the series will provide an introduction to variable costing. Finally, part three will compare the profits achieved under absorption and variable costing. So let us dive into absorption costing. In this video, we first want to consider the requirements of external reporting frameworks. We then want to understand how we value inventory using absorption costing and whether or not it complies with external reporting. After this, we want to be able to draw up an income statement using absorption costing principles. Finally, we will look at the arguments in favor of absorption costing. Before we dive into absorption costing, let us quickly review the external reporting requirements in terms of costing inventories. Remember, the main aim of accounting standards are to ensure transparency, reliability, consistency, and comparability of the financial statements. To achieve this, the accounting standards standardize the accounting policies and principles across a country. In South Africa, we apply the International Financial Reporting Standards, so we will look at what these say regarding the costing of inventory. First up is IAS 2, paragraph 10. This paragraph identifies all costs of purchase, costs of conversion, and other costs to bring the inventory to its current location and condition as forming part of the cost of inventory. When considering absorption and variable costing, we are most concerned with the treatment of conversion costs, particularly the overheads. So we can come to paragraph 12, and here we see that the external reporting requirements are that fixed and variable overheads need to be allocated to production. This ensures that matching is achieved, as we will only expense the overheads when the good is actually sold. So the key takeaway here is that for external reporting, the fixed overheads must be capitalized to the inventory. Now that we have seen the external reporting requirements, let us consider what absorption costing does and whether it complies with external reporting requirements. In a manufacturing setting, we have two broad cost classifications, namely manufacturing and non-manufacturing costs. Our manufacturing costs can be split into materials, labor, and overheads. Our overheads can be further split into variable and fixed overheads. When costing a product under absorption costing, all of our manufacturing costs, that is materials, labor, variable overheads, and fixed overheads, are capitalized to our product. Once the product is complete, it gets transferred to the finished goods, and once sold, the cost is transferred to profit or loss. For our non-manufacturing costs, which could include selling, administration, and other similar costs, these are not capitalized to our product, but are rather expensed immediately to profit or loss. Based on this, because our fixed manufacturing overheads are capitalized to inventory, Absorption costing complies with external reporting requirements, such as the International Financial Reporting Standards. In summary, our cost breakdown would look as follows. Note again that we are capitalizing our fixed overheads to inventory. Remember that the fixed overheads can be capitalized to inventory using plant-wide, departmental, or activity-based costing methods of allocation. What is the resultant absorption costing income statement structure? First, absorption costing splits the costs based on their purpose or function. Are the costs for manufacturing or non-manufacturing purposes? Our manufacturing costs relate to the production of the product and fall under our cost of sales. These costs are displayed above the gross profit line. Alternatively, our non-manufacturing costs do not relate to manufacturing and are expensed after the gross profit line. 
we then have our under or over recovery line. This item reflects the difference between our actual and absorbed fixed manufacturing overheads. It forms part of cost of sales and is therefore disclosed above the gross profit line. In this format, I have shown it separately to cost of sales so that you would be able to see its impact on the company's gross profit. Let us dive a little deeper into the under or over recovery. The under or over recovery arises when we close off our fixed overhead control account. The amount we actually spend on overheads may differ from the amount we absorb into production. This is because the amount we absorb into production is based on a predetermined overhead absorption rate. Two situations may arise. The first is that we absorb more overheads into production than what we actually spend. In such a case, let us say that we spend 1000 Rand on our overheads. We would put this on the debit side of our fixed overhead control account as the actual expense incurred. However, based on our predetermined overhead absorption rate, let's say that we absorb 1200 Rand into production. This would be an entry into the credit side of our account. As you can see, we have absorbed more into production than what we actually spent. If we balance our account, we will have an extra 200 Rand on the debit side. This represents an over recovery. We have over absorbed our overheads into production. This is reflected by the fact that we have absorbed 1,200 Rand, whereas we only spent 1,000 Rand. An overabsorption would be a credit in cost of sales, thereby reducing our cost of sales expense and increasing our gross profit. The second situation is that we absorb less overheads into production than what we actually spend. In such a case, let us say that we still spend 1,000 Rand on our overheads. As before, we would put this on the debit side of our fixed overhead control account as the actual expense. However, based on our predetermined overhead absorption rate, let us say that we only absorb 800 Rand into production. This would be our entry on the credit side of our account. Now you will see that we have absorbed less into production than what we actually spent. If we balance our account, we will have an extra 200 Rand on the credit side. This represents an under recovery. We have absorbed less into production than the amount we actually spent. An under absorption would be a debit and cost of sales, thereby increasing our cost of sales expense and reducing our gross profit. Let us wrap up absorption costing by looking at the arguments in favor of absorption costing. The first argument is that absorption costing is consistent with external reporting requirements. As we saw earlier, this is because it capitalizes the fixed overheads into the cost of inventory. Being consistent with external reporting requirements is important as we can keep one set of accounts for both decision making and external reporting, which reduces the amount of administration. It also means that we are using the same measures as the external market to determine the company's performance. The second argument is that absorption costing includes all production costs, most notably the fixed manufacturing overheads. Fixed overheads are essential for production and therefore it is argued that they should be capitalized to the units produced and included in the inventory valuation. This capitalization can also be considered important for decision making, as in the long run, all costs need to be accounted for, including our fixed overheads. Ignoring the fixed overheads in the inventory valuation and focusing only on the variable costs when making a decision may mean that managers could forget to account for the fixed costs. The counter argument, however, is that only a not so bright accountant would forget the fixed costs. Finally, absorption costing does not report fictitious losses. Because absorption costing capitalizes the fixed overhead, 
it follows the matching principle, and so the expense is only recorded in the period in which the sale is made. That brings us to the end of our video on absorption costing. Join us next time for an introduction into variable costing.